Good afternoon, MOSFES. I'm Simone, and I research and think about and sometimes write about surveillance and also teach at the University of Texas at Austin. And so the way I approach surveillance, I was the way I approach surveillance can be encapsulated in this image um, right here. Sorry, thank you. Um, this is a, a screen cap of a video from 2009. Um, it is of uh, Desi Cryer and Wanda Zaman. They call themselves Black Desi and White Wanda in the video. And they're two workers at a camping store in Texas who are testing out a new HB facial autom automated tracking system um, with the computer. And one of the things that happens in this video is that um, Black Desi says, watch what happens when my blackness enters the frame. And he's talking about the camera's seeming inability to follow him or to pan or to, to zoom and follow his face. But when White Wanda gets in there, the facial tracking system works. And so this question of what happens when blackness enters the frame can kind of neatly encapsulate the ways I've been thinking and trying to talk about surveillance um, for the last um, few years. And so, for example, there is this. Um, in 1966, Mary Van Britten Brown, um, a nurse uh, living in Queens, New York, along with her husband, Albert L. Brown, invented what they called a home security uh, surveillance system. So this was 1966, um, CCTV. And um, so Mary Van Britten Brown was a nurse, and she would often travel home uh, late at night. It was quite intric uh, intricate there. It uh, consisted of a video, uh, sorry, a, a doorbell uh, that she could unlock the door from um, her bed, um, audio intercom, and you can see this as a precursor to modern um, video doorbells or other type of home uh, surveillance um, systems. And so I kind of also, so you can see from the diagram, the robber there, well, you can tell it's a robber, I guess, because um, of the striped shirt and the sparsely populated beard and the hat. But so this, I can, you can almost think of it as a kind of abolitionist technology. She was really um, uh, concerned about the slow police response to que in Queens in her home whenever people would call for in cases of emergency. And so this do-it-yourself take on surveillance um, is one of the ways that I think about how black women's work has been absented from surveillance technologies, how we think about them, how we theorize them, and in this case, how they are created. So one of the key things that I do is I ask how um, our past can allow us to think critically about our present. And so um, this is an image from a law from New York City in the, in the 1700s. Um, there are lantern laws that required that black mixed race or indigenous people, if they were to walk around the city um, after dark and they weren't in the company of some white person, they would, be, uh, they would need to have with them a lit lantern as they moved about the city. If not, they could be taken up, arrested, and put in the galls until um, some owner, quote unquote, will come and um, get them. They could also be subject um, to beatings. And so this makes light a surveillance device, a supervisory device, but it also created uh, certain humans as the lighting infrastructure of this city. And so I look, took this to think about, you know, 200 years later or so, we have um, omnipresent policing uh, practices where light is used, um, high intensity floodlights are shone into people's um, homes uh, as a form of uh, surveillance, as a form of, um, you know, uh, protecting and lighting up uh, certain spaces. And so you see here this image is somebody who had took to Instagram to talk about the violence, uh, th think about the noise pollution or the sound pollution that comes from a large generator. So just uh, this summer, the American Medical Association uh, put out a warning on the effects of LED, LED lights, high intensity lights in the city that might have effects in terms of uh, uh, changing humans' cardiac rhythmicity, um, uh, an intense glare, and also um, heart palpations. And so we think, when I think about how um, the past allows us to, uh, to, make, uh, to ask critical questions about our present, I think about this lighting technology, this infrastructure, and the ways that uh, earlier, 300 years earlier in New York City, um, black, indigenous, and mixed race people were called upon or instructed to carry um, lanterns with them as they moved about after dark. And you can think about what type of humans or human life is valued as or devalued as infrastructure. So for example, in Austin, Texas in 2012 at this South by 
Southwest Festival, um, one group took, uh, one company, I guess, took it upon themselves to create homeless hotspots, where people who are made homeless or uh, under house were fitted with uh, Wi-Fi devices so that they could then be um, homeless hotspots for people who um, needed to have um, their tech uh, readily available. Uh, you have uh, another way in which light uh, is used as a form of discipline uh, in certain cities like Durham, uh, North Carolina, and also Tampa, Florida, there are ordinances uh, put in place that mandate that people who are uh, panhandling or flyering uh, are supposed to wear phosphorescent or glow-in-the-dark vests uh, if they are to do so. And so another thing that I, I looked at when I uh, think about surveillance is the ways in which black women uh, negotiate the TSA, the hair searches as they go through the airport. And I start with this uh, Solange Knowles, sister of Beyonce, took to Twitter a few years ago to complain about the discrimination that she, when she was subjected, subjected to a hair search um, by the TSA. And so you see that this social media site becomes a site of critique of state practices, and many others continue to do so. Um, they, uh, uh, sorry, they um, point to the ACLUs. Uh, they ask, tell each other to know their rights, and also form a generalized critique of surveillance by way of, uh, of Twitter and other sites. But I'm going to uh, return to uh, Black Desi and White Wanda to talk about biometric technology. So you can think of biometrics as doing a few things. They could be used for identification. So who are you in a face in the crowd, or even if you're enrolled in a particular um, biometric database. They could also be used for verification, so answering the question, are you who you say you are? And also could be used for automation. In the case of um, uh, Black Desi and White Wanda, so automation, is anyone there? And I looked at earlier uses of biometric technology to see the ways in which people critically engaged and challenged this markings of um, identity on the body. Uh, one of the ways that I did that is to look at, to historicize biometrics through the use, through thinking about um, the um, branding of enslaved people. And so this is a carte de visite um, of, of Wilson Chin from the 1860s. And you can see around his collar, he has, so around his neck, he has a metal collar. Uh, it's called a longhorn. Uh, what you can't see in this image is on his forehead, he has the brand, uh, VBN, branded on his forehead. And so he liberated liberated himself and escaped from slavery, but seemingly with this brand, it was impossible to escape, escape this marking on his forehead. And you can think about this marking as a traumatic head injury. And this is not to say that uh, branding of enslaved people and biometrics technology are one of the same, but it's to ask critical questions about how um, uh, biometrics, if you think as simply as body measurement, has been applied and used and resisted historically. And so we have this image um, from a screen grab from last year of a, um, a sink that seemingly uh, did not work for um, dark hands, but worked for um, light hands. Or we have uh, this image here also from last year of another automation technology uh, where someone had uploaded uh, images of his friend to um, a Google uh, photo tagging or photo identification site and would continually um, uh, categorize as his friend, a black woman, as a gorilla. And so we have to continue to think about what kind of training data um, is used to populate uh, these types of technologies. So I'm going to close um, with this, uh, this right here. So a couple of weeks ago, um, at the Georgetown uh, Law University Law School, uh, they released a, a, a report, a 150-page report on um, biometrics and facial recognition technology. You can, um, one of the things that they um, uh, found in this report is that in the US, over half of uh, adult Americans have their um, biometric Facial, facial features um, in a database, one or more, that can be accessed um, by the police. 
and you can find this at um, www.perpetuallineup.org. And so when we think about the ways that the business end of surveillance meets the business ends of policing, I want us to continue to be critical about, um, the propri about um, biometric technology, about algorithms, and who holds the proprietary data when people's bodies are, and parts and pieces of their bodies, or performances of their bodies, their biometrics, are um, uh, held by uh, whether it's Facebook or whether it is uh, uh, other types of sites and, uh, and policing. So what I will do, sorry, is uh, close uh, right here, but I will uh, close with the question that I started with to think critically about what happens when blackness enters the frame because I think it offers us some productive possibilities um, for our future. Thank you. Let's keep you up oh. here. I'm back. So anybody got any questions for Simone? Hi. Right down the front here. Sita Penyagin Gatter in London School of Economics. Um, I'm just, uh, so I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so Thank much. You. I think it's really important that um, these kinds of conversations are had in a setting that is historically um, not inclusive of conversations about race and the intersection of race and technology. Uh -huh. So thank you. Um, but one of the things that I'm wondering about because um, as uh, Sarah had said when she introduced you that you're sort of at the intersection of privacy, security, and digital inclusion. I was just wondering if you could expand upon the third aspect of that digital inclusion and maybe touch upon some of these positive or transformative things that you were alluding to at the end of your talk with your provocative question. Okay, so I think that um, the TSA example of people talking to TSA is transformative. If they can link uh, someone saying to know, linking a link on Twitter to the Know Your Rights campaign is talking about not only uh, using these technologies to think about what happens with the security theater um, in an airport. And so I think of myself as more of um, a gadfly. I think we have a particular set of skills and mine is not, you know, I'm not one of the people People that are creating or developing um, these technologies and but I would say that um, uh, so I think I, I, I left with that thing about what happens when blackness enters the frame and I think that black women using uh, their Twitter to um, formulate a critique of the state is something is about inclusion using the digital to have a more uh, equitable kind of ways in which we um, move through um, an airport space and so my suggestion is not to say well let's teach uh, young black girls how to code so that they could be you know, more easily exploited when they get older into the digital labor force, but to, um, to continue to have you know, these types of uh, discussions about what's at stake when 50% um, you know, of American adults have their face in a, a d database that is uh, accessible to the police, and when we think about the kind of over and hyper-policing of black people and pe people of color within the US and globally, what does this mean for the ways in which a biometrics could be linked to criminalization? And practices. Good question. Anybody else got a question for Simone? Yes, I can see gentlemen at the back. Yes, you. <laughs> so uh, a couple of the examples you gave, the sync, the facial recognition algorithm, and, and you know, I, I think I read that Connect, uh, face, mm -hmm. Microsoft Connect has faced similar issues, are, are quite obviously not malice, most likely, but, but rather, you know, um, Microsoft, for example, in the Connect case said, well, we tested it on our employees who are like 95 percent <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you see, uh, so, so obviously it's clear that when testing these things, things like QA departments will have to say like, you know, we can't do everything. Some people are handicapped. They might be hard to recognize or they're facially deformed or something like that. But there's, a, you know, a bunch of races and, and things like that, that obviously there's a lot of people that are going to be using this. We should be testing with that. Do you see a change in that? Do you see companies being more aware of this when they're working on biometrics? Yeah, and algorithms? I think there's a lot of kind of opacity with how these companies uh, do and create and research and develop these things, so I don't necessarily have the, um, the knowledge to, to track whether there is a change. But it seems to me that the, the way that the white body uh, becomes red as the default setting or, or produced as, the, as, the, as neutral as a kind of prototypical whiteness continues to happen. And so you would have someone uh, use YouTube to say that a sync doesn't work in 2015 
2015 or in 20, uh, 2009 say that the camera doesn't work or kinetic or just you know um, the uh, the one with the gorilla in 2015. So every year or so, uh, it seems that these kinds of um, the same type of uh, white neutrality uh, seems to be um, having uh, used as the kind of prototypical body when developing these things. And so it's the, it comes to the consumer or the users to use uh, a place like uh, Instagram or um, Twitter or um, you know uh, Facebook to offer a critique of you know who's entering the conversations and the development of these technologies. And so perhaps um, it might not necessarily be uh, the consumer's job to show people how anti-black these technologies are. And to pick up on your, your point then, so part of the problem is diversity in technology and the workforce, do you, do, do you feel? Yeah, part of the part of, I guess it could be diversity, but we can have a diverse amount of people and we could still have like an anti-black frame into how these things are developed. So I think it needs diversity, but also um, equity as well too. Okay, any other questions for Simone? I'm looking around. I have one more question. Okay. I'm kind of <laughs> eager to eager, eager to ask. So, uh, in your university, I mean, you're here talking to a bunch of technologists, uh -huh. largely, and I'm guessing that you're, the subjects you teach about back in, in in Austin, then I'm guessing that you're mainly not te talking to technologists, or do you, do you kind of talk to technologists about this too? Yeah, so I have a variety of students um, okay. in my class from mm. uh, electrical engineering to women's studies and also black studies. And so we can come together in a quite uh, collaborative and interdisciplinary way to talk mm -hmm. about um, these technologies, yeah. Great, okay. If there are no further questions, then let's thank Simone. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. you.